Dave Cohen uh, and uh, I'm hosting this uh, episode of the Writers Guild um, Zoom discussion uh, series and it's about uh, how to make a living at a comedy, can we make a living at comedy. Um, I've just about managed to do that for about 37 years or so uh, but it has um, taken it's it's definitely um, getting tougher but there are new ways um, as well as the old ones of coming in I started in 1983 uh, writing topical jokes for Radio 4 uh, which amazingly is something that you still can do and we'll talk about that as well but um, what I'll do now is I'll introduce all the people uh, who are on the panel for today so first of all um, say hello to Bennett Bennett Aaron give us away Bennett thank hello. you Bennett uh, is a sitcom writer stand-up performer radio performer uh, including his own show uh, called Jew Elsh, uh, novelist, teacher. He's been uh, one of the great mainstays of the British comedy world now for what, 20 years, I think. Um, and uh, also welcome Hannah, Hannah George. Hiya. Hannah has written for loads of uh, TV shows, has achieved great success as a writer and uh, director of uh, online comedy sketches that have been seen by millions. And she has won uh, the Writers Guild Award uh, on, uh, for Best Online Comedy um, twice, which is uh, amazing because it's only happened three times um, with her uh, with her co-writer, uh, Natasha Danraj. And... Um, brilliant online sketches so it's good to have Hannah with us and uh, also we have um, Emily Allen say hi Emily Emily Hello. is uh, Emily is uh, from the BBC uh, she's a member of the BBC youth panel uh, she's been working with the BBC comedy controller uh, Shane Allen uh, and they're looking at new ways of uh, getting emerging writers uh, into work um, and also uh, joining us, uh, very pleased to have the uh, chair of the Writers Guild Comedy Committee, Nat Nat Tapley. Uh, great writer, great performer, and also a, a, a bit of an online star. Actually, he's um, uh, his uh, alter ego. Um, don't be too nasty to him. He's actually a Conservative MP uh, called uh, Sir Ian Bowler. Uh, I think he who may be uh, carving up the BBC as we speak, but. Um, not now so i think we can probably um get started with the actual discussion um now i've i've given this uh talk a few times at various places how do you make a living at stand-up comedy and uh generally what happens is i i identify the sort of four main ways that um, that can happen um the first way i've already mentioned is by writing topical comedy and we'll talk about that uh, in a bit um the second way is writing a brilliant hilarious sitcom script um usually for the bbc competition or a, a bursary um number three is uh the growing one now and it's going to only get bigger and more so with the covid whatever is the online uh creating online content podcasts sketches uh webisodes is a word i've come to hear and learn to live with in recent months um like sort of two minute sitcom episodes and uh, the other way the fourth way is through uh performing uh, performing your own material or doing improv uh, uh, all, uh sketch shows or whatever so let's uh those are the four main ways so we'll start with um the bad news first uh and i'm gonna talk to bennett about this as a uh, uh, so, sorry to, to pick on you uh for this sort of downbeat opening but uh for years you have made most of your living as a, a stand-up comedian haven't you so how how are things looking on that score at the moment Oh, well, thanks for bringing everything down. Um, yeah, when uh, when this started, on the day we sort of went into lockdown, uh, I had email after email and text messages cancelling everything. And I lost all my work, really, for the rest of the year. All, you know, I had gigs abroad, I had gigs in this country, and I lost, you know, the, the rest of my salary for this year, which, you know, is depressing. So I, I had to sort of think, quickly so I did two things um, I bought a website a, a domain called 
selfisolating.co.uk and set it up as a script editing service for people. And I'd normally charge £100 an hour and I decided I'd charge £25 an hour to, to try and generate some work. And that sort of worked quite well. And then I started doing online sitcom writing workshops and I've had you know, a couple of hundred people do it, some of whom now have had their own sitcom scripts um, uh, in production. So it, I realised that I'm not, I've done some online gigs and you know, they're, they're not fun generally. Um, so I, I had to diversify really quickly. I was going to ask about the online gigs. So I have seen a few, and I, um, and I mean, I've I've watched. Uh, I've known, you know, I know a lot of people who've suddenly lost uh, that source of income, uh, and uh, you know, the, the the best will in the world. They are uh, that they, they are difficult. Have you done any actual gigs since uh, the sort of partial easing of lockdown? Um, yeah, I did two um, outdoor ones and I did one at the Bearcat in Twickenham and it was so fun. I mean the gigs were great but it was just so lovely to be back on stage and do all my hilarious Covid material. <laughs> uh, you and all the other comedians with all their hilarious uh, Covid material <laughs> I guess. Yeah, yeah we all yeah. did the same jokes. Of yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll, 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 come, we'll be talking about um, sitcom and sitcom writing uh, a, a little later on but I just would like to uh, stay with the performing side as I say I'm sort of getting the, the, the bad news out of the way first but what, for, for uh, people starting out I'd be uh, interested uh, to know for you know by the way we have the, 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 the chat uh, mode um, and if um, any of you who are here if you could just in the chat you could tell us if you are uh, a performer as, uh, as well as a writer because um, that, that's definitely been something that um, has happened a lot in uh, recent years, more people who are writers as well as performers. Yes, we've got uh, both, uh, yes, uh, stand-up comedian and comedy writer, uh, lapsed performer here, yes, okay, yes, performer. So yes, yeah, so we have got a lot of people who were hope hoping to start out performing what 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 do you think um well uh, apart from obviously concentrating on the writing what do you think they should uh, should be doing um well it, it's funny you know i i only became a stand-up because of the writing because I, I used to write sketches years and years ago for people like um Hail and pace and and people like that and the real mccoy and um and i remember sending in a sketch which i thought was the funniest thing i'd written and the producer went, oh, no, this isn't particularly funny. What else have you got? And I said, no, no, that, honestly, that, that's, I know that that's funny. And he went, well, it, it's not. Anyway, what else? And it played on me. And the only way I could find out if it was funny was to try it out. So I wrote myself five minutes of material and um, went to the King's Head in Crouch End, which is where the yeah, majority of comedians on the circuit started, and tried it out. And it got um, a big laugh. And that was it. And that, I mean, I'm, I'm not, even though I trained as an actor, I'm naturally quite shy and the thought of being on a stage, it didn't really appeal. But that immediate response to something I'd written was uh, just incredible. So uh, I always say to people, you know, it, it, the writing to me comes first. It's all very well having the ability to perform, but that the writing is the, you know, the fundamental aspect of it. So write yourself a good five minutes of material, try it out, try it out to, to family and friends, which is always a way of just getting into it record yourself doing it just to see how it looks how it comes across and then you know of hopefully when things are back to normal you can try to do um, open spots in places uh, that's a great that's really good uh, advice i think thanks bennett that's that's great um i mean sadly i think um that we won't there won't we won't be seeing much kind of improv or sketch acting for for a while but i mean i think that's a really good uh, piece of advice if you if uh, you see yourself as a performer as well but um, but yes so the, the, uh, online has definitely been uh, so there's been a sort of massive increase uh, in uh, online comedy it's, 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 it's only going to increase some more so uh, I should bring in uh, Hannah at this point and I was um, Hannah have you have you noticed uh, much difference on your little uh, internet or your other your giant internet universe <laughs> <laughs> um, well to be honest with my sort of online content um i kind of it it sort of makes up like if this is about making money from comedy like it makes up maybe one percent of what i earn a year like it it's for me it's not a big thing despite the fact i've had a few that have gone 
pretty viral and then I've won the awards, which has been absolutely amazing. In terms of actually making money online, it's really, really hard to make any money doing it. Um, but I think the thing with online content, which I notice, is if you're going to do something online, try and do something for a start that stars you if you can. If you can be a performer, try and do it because it sort of, I feel like it raises your, your profile a little bit. Like my journey was I started doing stand up, then got really nervous and didn't want to do it anymore. But by which time I'd signed to an agent and started writing on uh, TV shows. So I was able to stop doing that. But then a few years went by, about five years went by, and I, um, I realised that I was writing a lot of kids' TV, which I absolutely love, and there's quite a lot of work in kids' TV, and I don't begrudge it for a second, but I was always like, well, comedy is really what I want to do. Um, so I started thinking, how can I get back into the performing side of things as somebody who's quite a nervous performer and kind of doesn't really want to do it? And that's where my podcast, which is called Drunk Women Solving Crime, that came around. And I think that's been really useful. And we can make a bit of money doing the podcast um, because we do have quite a lot of listeners um, and the podcasting world is something that literally the amount of listeners you have equates to how much money you can make it's there's nothing really other than if you're making but you also have to get quite a lot of listens to um, get to that point I think that's a fair point actually as well uh, podcasting is definitely I mean we've done uh, I do the sitcom geeks podcast with James Carey we've just we, we've done about 150 of those now and they, they don't actually it's, it's 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 not a huge form of income but it does uh, have uh, a, a sort of it's because it's something that I've got a knowledge on it it helps more people to know about me and the things I do and if you've got uh, something a particular skill or or, or an interest um, podcasting is a is a relatively cheap uh, way of, of doing yeah, something absolutely I think also it's sort of like for me you know you, you've got the kids tv on one side and then my podcast is you know about serial killers for the most part so <laughs> it's kind of telling people that I don't you know I'm not just doing kids stuff um, and I want to do you know adult comedy as well and I think winning the awards for those sketches of mine that was a really big thing in terms of kind of profile and helping sort of really establish myself as I also do um, comedy um, you know, adult comedy, but that makes it sound a bit weird calling it adult comedy. But yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Nat, you uh, also you, you, you've done a lot of uh, online stuff, haven't you? Your your yes. uh, character here, Sir Ian. Yes, but again, I think what Hannah pointed out is really, if you're looking to make a living at comedy, it's well worth realizing that the um, the advertising rates on podcasts are much higher than they are um, on video content. So what an advertiser is paying for a thousand listeners on a podcast is way higher than they're paying for a thousand views of a video. So if, if making a living or even making enough money to keep getting by is what you're looking to do, audio seems at the moment, certainly in lockdown, like what you should be focusing on because you can still make audio in lockdown to a fairly high uh, level, um, unless you're the archers, in which case you just decide not to bother um you so you can make audio um, and you can also if you can get a listenership of a reasonable size start bringing in some money and making a living from comedy that way also yeah. i think that in sorry dave to interrupt mm. um there's just i think in terms of those kind of um those people like your michael spices for example like with what michael does is it's it's great because he can do that really really quickly he can do it every time there's a big news story and alistair green for example he's got the thing that he does and it's all very lo-fi you know it's just a you know a, a a camera in a room and I would say that's a lot better so for example my sketches that went viral one was like a little sketch um which I wasn't in um and then another was a sketch that again I wasn't in at all and actually anybody knowing it was me that did those sketches is completely enough that's why I have a website I have my website just so people who maybe want to employ me as a writer go to it and they can go oh she did that sketch that I saw that's cool um so that's what I'd say as well is have a website for yourself like I've got my agent's website but also with all of the stuff that I do online um, there's sort of no record because as soon as your video goes viral as well people just steal it and like they'll just put it up on their own YouTube page or they'll put it I mean that was incredible with I did a sketch called my father uh, well what was it watch this incredible moment when this father of four his silence for the first time and within like God, with, yeah, within 24 hours, like probably about 40 YouTube channels had uploaded it. And, and you know, and that, that went really viral. That got hundreds of millions of views. But on my YouTube page, it got maybe about 4 million views. And across everything with that 
that video, I made maybe, maybe just under two grand, which is actually quite a lot of money, but that's across like four years of, you know, places with license it and it got showed yeah. on mood tube and stuff. But you know, that's, that's my biggest success in terms yeah, what, of that. What's, what's it called again? Oh, it's called watch this incredible moment when this father of four hears silence for the first time. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. One thing. Sorry, I should have mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we will be uh, we, we'll, we'll, we'll be doing a Q and A uh, at, at the end, and uh, I've noticed a few of you have already uh, asked some questions. I will get to those questions uh, at the end of uh, the, the, the the chat. I'd like to bring in uh, Emily at this point because uh, Emily, you've been uh, sitting there listening to us all uh, talking about some. Um, not being able to make much money yet but uh you're working uh you you work uh for the bbc can you, can you sort of tell us exactly what your uh job entails yeah of course hello everyone thanks for having me <laughs> um yes yeah, so i'm a development producer in the comedy commissioning team um which essentially means i commission a few bits but also it's a new role which is largely designed to help people out like you like to find kind of create more space for new writers new writer performers new people we want to work with um because as the industry changes you know we want to connect more directly with people who we want to work with um so yeah so i essentially try and bring new exciting talent into the team that's that's my job which is a lot of fun yeah. <laughs> um um, I was going to say, because uh, the, 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 I mentioned the four ways into uh, making a living at, at uh, comedy, I missed out uh, the fifth one, which uh, has applied most of the time, which is if you want to make a living at comedy, you have to be white, male, uh, middle class with an with uh, unearned income uh, availability. Now, um, is, is that, um, do you think that's sort of being addressed uh, at the moment? You work with Shane Allen, don't you, the controller of BBC Comedy? Is that, is that being addressed at all? Yeah, so we're quite a sort of slimline team. So Shane's the head of our team, but we've got a team of four commissioners and me. And um, yeah, I mean, I think if you look at our output, um, look at the stuff that's working on our across our slates at the moment, um, I think you'd find that that's not that's not who's getting commissioned at the moment. Um, it's much more exciting and inclusive than that. Um, you've got shows like there's so much out there. You've got shows like Man Like Mabine, Young Offenders. Um, this, uh, it's just it's just not how it was. I think there's still a sort of a real preconception um, that that is who we are awarding our projects to, and um, we feel so strongly that that's not why we exist or what we want to do, and that we're working so hard to change that. And um, you know that's why we've got a lot more roots in than we used to have as well so we're looking to do more audio um we've got things called threesomes which are quite entry level so that's an opportunity to do pitch three by three minutes things that would sit on bbc3 um, and we're also piloting a lot more stuff than we used to as well so i think you know often it's a lot of pressure to go straight to series as a new writer um so what we're trying to do is protect more spaces on our slate to enable newer writers um, to feel like they can they can break in without it being like too much exposure too quickly. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's um. Uh, there's also there's the uh, the bursaries, aren't there? You have the Golden and Simpson uh, bursary, uh, and um, are there are there's uh, the Felix Dexter. Um, are, are, are those going to be uh, carrying on? Uh, yeah. So. Um, our bursaries are really important to us um, and we've had real success with them. So Sophie Willen um, won last year's Carolina Hearn bursary and she's just been given a sitcom on BBC Two. Um, so the people who we do put through our schemes, we really, we really try and invest in, like we want them to be the, the future of, of writing. Um, so we've got the Carolina Hearn bursary, we've got the Felix Dexter bursary, which will launch before the end of this year. Um, and we've also got the Galton and Simpson bursary, which is just just closed, applications for that have just closed. And the idea is that we stagger those openings across the year um, so that, you know, whatever time of year it is, hopefully there's something you can apply for. 
okay um i just want to go back to hannah now just to sort of um with the online uh comedy aspect uh we've we talked a little bit about podcasts but um let's say that uh i i want to make a like a two minute sketch um to you know showcase my talents or whatever uh i've got no money and i've got no experience and probably not a huge amount of time how how, how would i go about it and um, to me i think it's like um it's the idea it's always the idea again if you go back to michael spicer you go back to alistair green like it's the they just have these ideas that they can you know literally shoot on a on a phone um and so my one that went viral the father his silence sketch we shot that um on an iphone because we were parodying people filming people hearing for the first time so that was great because if we'd actually made it well then it wouldn't have worked as a video because it's supposed to be a parody of that so and also i think the internet loves itself so anything that you can do that's a parody of the internet things that are going viral things that are sort of satirical um i think that people don't particularly care that much about high sort of production values you know i make short films as well and that's where i'm like right this needs to look good and we need to sort of make sure everyone's in the right costume and we have the right props but i think for just stuff you're gonna put online and try and sort of build your profile and do your own sort of funny thing yeah. I, I don't think people necessarily care anyone can do it if you've got a phone yeah a funny script uh is a funny script even if it looks a bit shabby but um the best the best production values will never disguise a not very good script i think uh, yeah. Nat, Nat, have you got anything to add to that yeah i just think it's worth bearing in mind as well as the idea sometimes um the character itself can do a lot of heavy lifting so as well as the people hannah's mentioning you've got rosie holt and fergus craig who are doing great stuff in lockdown because they found a character who they can use to talk about in the modern world really quick again it's about being able to do it quickly and by yourself and you can do it and you can do that with a character that shines through whatever the production values are it's just on a phone yeah um okay well we'll uh, we'll come back to you guys um in a, in a moment i'm just going to talk for a a minute or so now about um topical comedy which is the the, the other way in it's a very uh it, it, it's been a, for years a very exclusive uh, way of getting in very few people have done it but it's actually uh one of the quickest ways to get into making a living at writing comedy um the bbc bbc radio and BBC Scotland have between them uh, a number of shows that uh, take writers, take jokes from uh, non-commissioned writers, so that's people people starting out and um, as I say that's how I began uh, in 1983 um, so that's um, I, I, and it is still the way in you can uh, there's a show called Newsjack which is on Radio 4 Extra it's on uh, about 12 weeks a year a series of that's just finishing now but there'll be another series uh, in January uh, there's a series of BBC Scotland uh, called Breaking the News I'm not sure if they're taking new writing material at this point but they they make 20 shows a year and have been doing for, for five six years so they will be looking for new writers at some point um, and then there's a show that's recently started called the the skewer which is at series two uh, which is basically the inside of the brain of john holmes who's a brilliant uh, comedy writer and performer and uh, he used to he used to uh, be on the now show um, he also came up with great characters Characters for uh, Dead Ringers, and um, it's a it's it's a quite amazing show. If you listen to radio, uh, I recommend hearing this show because it's 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 like um, there was a show by Chris Morris a few years ago called Jam, and it's Blue Jam, uh, and it's like that only it's topical. Um, so these opportunities uh, they do exist, uh, but it is that it, it, it is a particular skill being able to write topical comedy. And I've got uh, a lot of information. If you go to uh, my uh, website, DaveCohen.org.uk, I've got a lot of material uh, uh, about some um, writing topical comedy, or um, uh, we, I've written quite a few blogs about it um, on our Sitcom Geeks Patreon site as well. So uh, there is a specific. Uh, 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 skill so uh, the skewer sorry is the name of the show um, that, that um, I mentioned the, the John Holmes one I think that series is just coming to an end now as well but it will get more series and John is uh, really keen to get material from from new writers um, so 
yes a topical uh, it, it's worth a go i've been working with a few writers in the last few weeks and they've been getting uh, jokes on uh, news jack uh you get something like 25 pounds for your joke um which is you know it's not quite going to pay the mortgage but it might it might fund one of uh, hannah's videos i think uh, 25 quid do you think yeah fine that's all right yeah <laughs> Almost so, as much as I got from BBC Three. So, right. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, so great. Um, so, so that's uh, that. That is a, an area that, it, 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 but it, it is a very sort of s special skill writing topical jokes. It's a, but you know, you can you can learn it, and uh, I think if you have the a sort of interest in uh, the news, what's going on in the world, then um, that's that's definitely a, a route you should consider uh, going down. So let's uh, move on now to uh, talking a bit more about uh, sitcom. Uh, now, we've already spoke to uh, Emily about the, the various um, bursaries that the BBC offer. And in order to um, uh, get a chance of um, winning one of those bursaries, you have to write a brilliant sitcom script. Uh, and they also, the BBC has a, a competition every April, usually, uh, the BBC Writers' Room, which is uh, an amazing, totally understaffed resource, but they are, they, they do sort of do wonders. They got something like 3,600 entries to their last uh, competition in April. But if you can write a brilliant sitcom for them, um, then uh, that's that would be... Um, that that's definitely worth um, a, a attempting. So, Bennett, um, uh, just to say um, on that, yeah. for it's for the for some of our schemes, you do need a full sitcom script, but for others, you don't. And I think we want to yeah. encourage like it's it's a big ask to, to submit a sort of a fully formed yeah. sitcom script. So for the Carolina Hearn bursary, um, it originally started. Obviously, it's for Carolina Hearn, and it originally started as a character competition. Oh, right. um, so with that, we don't ask people to submit a full script. We ask for people to just do an outline and then do a little piece to camera of the character that. Um, in their script yeah. essentially okay. so there's there's not always the demands of a full script so i think that's a lot to put on on yeah. any writer and i think the golden and simpson one wasn't that 10 page the first 10 yeah. pages yeah, yeah. okay exactly. yeah so um, but uh, i mean if you want to write the first 10 pages of uh, a, a sitcom then uh you um you might as well write the whole script you might as well know what's going to happen really it will, will, will help but um i want to bring uh Be bennett in now bennett and i both teach uh sitcom writing in fact bennett you've got a uh you've got a course coming up uh next week is that correct yeah i've got a course starting on monday it'll be the fifth sixth online one i've done um i only have about 30 people doing it at a time and it's from 11 till 12 every day just for an hour and I, um, I get people to write um, a scene from something and I give notes on it. And the majority of people who did the, the first three have sent in scripts for the adversaries, which is great. So they're, they're waiting here and I've, I've helped them to work on the outlines and things like that. So it's, it's been really good and the feedback's been great. And there's a lot of talented writers out there. Right. And and also, uh, I should say, can I just say, just if you like, when I first started, I entered all the competitions in the world and I never won a single one. But now, you know, I make my living writing. So if you don't win a competition, do not like, mm -hmm. I know, because it's so hard, isn't it? Because you have to take so much rejection all the time. Yeah. But I always think that if I'm not being rejected, like at least once a week, then I'm not doing enough. Like, genuinely, like, that's the one thing that I think is the most important thing is if you enter the comedy room and you don't get in, it's not because you're rubbish. It's because there's only 10 spaces um, yeah. or, or whatever. So yeah, I think that's the thing. Just try and like, almost like try and get those rejections. Just be like, right, I need to put enough stuff out. That's a, a great uh, piece of advice. Thanks for that, Hannah. And also just mentioned in uh, our episode 150 of Sitcom Geeks, we interview uh, Guy Jenkin and Andy Hamilton, who are probably two of the most successful writers of the last 20, 30 years. Uh, Drop the Dead Donkey they did and Outnumbered, which is a, was a great hit and is still considered a great hit. But they were telling us that since about uh, 2012, they've written uh, 15 pilot scripts for the BBC and um, they've all been rejected so if if those guys are getting their scripts rejected um, you're, you're in and and you are too and and we are of course uh, you are in uh, very good company so um, 
but yeah, a lot of love for uh, Bennett's uh, sitcom courses coming through on the chat. I'm not David X. Cohen, by the way, who wrote The Simpsons. Uh, God, I wish I was. Um, so, but th thanks for the... Uh, that to question anyway. So I, I'm not even the most successful. Uh, I'm not even the most successful Dave Cohen in the world of uh, comedy writing. So uh, uh, there you go. But um, let's talk. I mean, uh, so so we talk about sitcom writing, and uh, I mean the, the the word sitcom. Uh, I mean, it's what it is has changed so much in uh, recent years. So Bennett, uh, let's say you've got some. Um, two people who come to you and say right I want to write the next flea bag and then someone else comes and says yeah I want to write the next Mrs Brown's boys um so you've got these two people in a room what can you say that will apply to both of them well I'd probably ask the Mrs Brown's boys person to leave uh, <laughs> no I'm I'm being hilarious um everybody like has different tastes and mm -hmm. some people like comedy but um I mean what I would do is is the, the same thing you know, I mean, whether it's Mrs. Brown's Boys, Freeback, the, the, and what I do at the start of each workshop, we talk about sitcoms that we like. And funny enough, Faulty Towers seems to be the one that everybody, after all these years, still loves. So I talk about the fact that it's down to plot, it's down to characterization, it's down to structure. Um, and once you've got that, then, you know, whichever way you want to go with a comedy, you can go. But unless you have those, unless you have good characters, unless you have strong outlines, then, you know, there's little point writing. I get sent loads of scripts to, to edit where you can tell the person has just started writing and they haven't done the groundwork. They haven't worked on characters. They haven't worked really um, on the plot. So that's what I would say, just to work on that, work on the plots, work on the characters um, and, and plot it all out scene by scene before you start writing. You know, it, it's like building a house unless you've got the groundwork there, it's all going to fall apart. So whatever style, whatever you want to write, that's what you have to start doing first and then add the layers to it afterwards. Yeah, and in fact, I'm uh, running a competition which opens uh, on the 26th of October um, uh, with um, British comedy guide BCG Pro. And this competition is to write a two minute scene. And uh, I'm actually asking people to send, uh, send me these two minute scenes, partly because uh, if I get sent 300 scripts, uh, I can read them. Whereas if I get a whole script, um, I'm gonna be up till sort of three in the morning every day for the next three months. But uh, a two-minute scene is a great way of uh, getting you into the good habits of writing sitcom. A number of scripts, like Bennett, I read lots of scripts. And big things that often happen is uh, that, that I get is there often... Um, the, um, there's nothing happens in a scene. No, uh, as, as Bennett says, you have to plot and plot and make sure at least one thing happens in a scene. Um, I get a lot of scripts as well from people who say, oh, I can write a script. I worked in a supermarket. I can write a really funny script about working in a supermarket. Um, not necessarily. Uh, it, it comes back, as Bennett says, to character and plot. Um, a very common mistake a lot of people make is um, you've been a, worked at a place or you've had a really sort of interesting thing that happened to you and you start to build it into a sitcom and uh, you're so excited and you've got all these crazy people around that you, you're so excited to, to, to write, you end up that, 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 that you the, is the lead character uh, and they're really boring. <laughs> They've got nothing uh, to say. So be... be uh, be prepared to fictionalize your life. This is a sitcom is not real life, it's entertainment. Uh, so those are the sort of main things that I would mention about that. Uh, I was corrected in the chat, someone mentioned that the Golden and Simpson bursaries actually was actually a false script. So yes, um, uh, you're right, apologies uh, for that. So, um, okay, I, uh, what I would like to do uh, I've got an interesting uh, question for, for Nat and Bennett and Hannah. Uh, we're, we're going to talk a little bit now about the life of a comedy writer. So um, assuming you've not got a commission on at this point, um, in your week, um, how many hours a week do you actually write? Not got a commission on? I've never heard yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Ridiculous assumption. Uh, personally, I write uh, every day and have done for years and years and years. Um, I have to, and I get really 
down if I if I don't. It's like people who, who go to the gym and if they don't go to the gym, they get very down. Um, unless I'm writing, I, I, I do feel um, very, uh, like I haven't achieved anything. So I'll try and write about three hours a day, but usually I can't write before two o'clock. Nothing comes to me. I'm one of those people that has to write um, in the afternoon for some reason. I know a lot of people write early in the morning, some late at night. I'm, I'm good between uh, two and six for everything. Mm. Okay. Oh, so we've got you at the, we got Peak Bennett. I'm very <laughs> pleased. Yeah, yeah. I'm fading, but yeah, just yeah. at the moment. <laughs> Hannah? Um, well, I mean, I've, I've got a lot of things on at the moment, which is, which is really nice. So for me at the moment, a lot of it is juggling. So um, I will write from, uh, generally, I'd say like 10 till 4 is my working day. Um, and that is whilst I'm sort of knee deep in working on shows at the moment. But I also think that the, the sort of the sign of a good writer is not somebody that can write when people are paying you for it. It's when you can sit down and write when you haven't got that commission. And a couple of years ago, I had months and months without any work. And but I still sat down 10 to 4 every day and wrote a movie script, which then got me my new agent because I changed agents. Um, so I think that was the sign that I could, um, I don't know, just that I really had to write was that I still did it when, you know, no one was paying me for it. But luckily because I'd done some work before, I always think whenever I get paid for anything with writing, I'm like, it's not like wages, it's just time. It's like money is just time that I can keep calling myself a writer. And I think as I was running out of money, I wanted to keep being able to call myself a writer. So I, you know, I wrote this script. Um, but yeah, I, I think that it's completely a personal thing as well, isn't it? Um, like, don't try and w write for too long if you're not feeling it just stop because it's probably going to be crap like I always think that I think don't push don't be like oh I've got to write for 12 hours a day because uh, I, I don't have any writers that do that um well uh Nat how about you um yeah again at the moment I'm quite lucky in that I do have my days full of some stuff I'm doing but when that's not the case I think I, I certainly don't have a set number of hours a day that I work. I mean, some days will just be a lot of reading and making myself angry. So find, trying to find something that I want to write about takes a while. I mean, not that the world doesn't make me hugely angry all the time at the moment, but uh, <laughs> it's fine. I think just as important as sitting down and putting pen to paper for me is finding, is absorbing things from the outside world to find something that sparks something that gets the fingers going. Yeah. That's okay. what's been hard about lockdown as well, I think, is that mm. actually the inspiration that you used to get by sitting opposite someone on the tube or like just anything. Now I just have to write things, taking the piss out of my boyfriend and it's been hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, and some very uh, funny uh, Twitter uh, photographs. Yeah, it counts as writing, but it does count. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I'm... I'm a bit of a, uh, I'm the opposite end of the scale to, to Bennett. I try and um, get up and um, just, just get as much writing done as possible in the morning. Um, and that's partly because um, in the last couple of years or so, I've become, uh, I've, I've, I've got more kind of interested in, in uh, self-publishing and, and uh, I, I've been, I, I've actually, I've got, a, I've got a, a novel coming out in March and so I've been learning a lot about uh, the process and that's also been sort of telling me a lot about the process of comedy and what's happening uh, with comedy but I think, you know, I, I think all of us, Nat, Bennett, Hannah and myself, uh, as part from writing, uh, there are so many other things uh, that you have to do. What 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 skills uh, do you do you all have apart from sitting down writing stuff that makes people laugh? Oh, genuinely nothing. I don't <laughs> know what, like, oh what? come on! You you direct you di directed a movie. You know? <laughs> yeah. So do you mean just in terms of making comedy that's not just writing scripts? I just uh, just in terms of you know I if you say I want to be a comedy writer uh, you have to be aware that uh, it's not a case of just um, I, I'm um, coming into the office uh, at X time and I'm writing and then at the end of the day uh, I leave the office and that's yeah. it that's all fine it's all all the uh, being a freelance being a, a sole trader and all those those kind of things. Mm. 
I'm quite good at spreadsheets. That's my thing. So what I've started oh. doing is like genuinely, like I've sort of first started to got my first agent, I think like 10 years ago. And I've had, you know, hundreds and hundreds of meetings over, over those 10 years. And there are so many production companies and so many producers that if I'd have started a bloody database when I first started, that's my biggest piece of advice is right now, if you're meeting people, even if it's just an email, even if you're you've interacted with them on Twitter, write them down in a thing and be like, this is what they did this is the script they read because it's so easy to forget and it's so easy to lose contact with people you know I'll have met someone 10 years ago and they'll have just made like the biggest show and I've been like oh, if only I'd emailed them again at some point um, so I think just keeping in touch with people is something that's um, just really important yeah. Yeah. as someone who's like looking for talent as well I think you said it earlier Hannah but um having a website is so helpful um you sort of see someone's short film online and you'll be like that's brilliantly written and then you go and try and find them and you can't find anything on them yeah. um and I, I do I really try and track people down who's writing I love but there's some sometimes you feel like you're just like a deep invasion of privacy before you've worked <laughs> out who's written something um so that from a you know from someone who, who's trying to bring new writers in it's that's a super helpful thing that um makes everyone's lives easier <laughs> when it comes to picking people out yeah i have i have just updated uh, my website and it is actually um partly kind of ahead of the kind of publication of the books and things so it's uh, it's been a, f a fairly expensive thing to do because it's it's about sort of getting internet traffic and all that kind of thing but actually you know you you can it is possible to build a website for absolutely nothing and with really minimal uh technology skills and so yeah. you know just get yourself a wordpress page and yeah. well, to, be, um, to be honest i think uh, i said website but actually just having an instagram or a twitter or something some sort of way that someone can get in touch with you it doesn't need to be a fully fledged website i think like you know if you're a photographer it's helpful but like as a writer um if someone's seen your work somewhere it's just like giving them a way to contact you so it could be an email address it could be instagram it could be twitter and there's so many people that i've met through you know sending them an instagram off the back of seeing them do a show or right, having like read a script and then sort of forgotten about it or whatever so yeah please like please do that because we really want to meet you <laughs> <laughs> and um so for the again uh hannah uh, bennett and nat hands up if you enjoy uh doing your accounts Oh, Bennett loves it. Oh, great. Yeah. I said I, I mean, love a spreadsheet. That's bullshit. I do not like it. Yeah, not that spreadsheet. I actually yeah. started it. I'm doing it, funny enough, this morning. And no, I hate it. But I've had to do, oh, it's really dull. But I, I'm trying to do a, a VAT return. And now I've been told that I've done it all badly and have been doing it badly for the last three quarters. So, yay. <laughs> Matt, so, how about you? What's your, uh, what, what's your specialist skill? I think my specialist skill, or the one I developed, not having had when I started, which cost me at the beginning, was learning at which point an overdue invoice uh, becomes one which you can statutorily apply interest to, and then writing back to the person who hasn't paid it, saying, by the way, I'm adding interest from today, which gets you paid the next day almost immediately, almost all the time. Mm, and good. the details are available, I believe, on the writing website. If not, they're on the NUJ website. They've got it calculated. Which yeah. I, I should actually mention, I haven't really uh, talked much about the Writers Guild, but uh, I, I have been a member for all, all that, all that um, uh, amount of time. And um, uh, Nat, as I mentioned at the start, is the chair of the Writers Guild Comedy Committee, which is a relatively new thing. So uh, it is a, a very good time to join the Writers Guild, I would say, if you aren't uh, a member. I mean, the pandemic has sort of Brought, uh, highlighted the need for us all to work together and uh, protect our livelihoods now um, and uh, it's also a big uh, place for campaigning and uh, we're, uh, we've got a BBC that needs saving as I mentioned uh, earlier. We offer support and protection for writers at every stage of their writing careers so there's different uh, membership packages, students, emerging writers, professional writers um, and they also negotiate the uh, minimum uh, wage agreements uh, across the industry. And that's not just BBC, ITV, you know, the Guild is in uh, constant negotiation with Netflix and, uh, uh, and all the uh, um, American companies as well. So um, there's a lot of good, uh, good, good stuff coming from that. Uh, can, I, get... uh, can I just add, sorry, Dave, um, uh, mm -hmm. just talking about the Writers Guild. I wrote um, 12 episodes of a, uh, of a sitcom and didn't get paid for it. The producers sort of did a runner, even though the program went out. 
Um, I didn't get paid at all for it and turned to the Writers Guild for help and they've been uh, incredible in helping to try and get some of the money back. So I just wanted to... Was that Mrs Brown's boys? <laughs> no, Anna, no. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it's a, there's a, there's a lo loads of uh, loads of reasons. There's a very good reason, one very good reason among many there to uh, be a member. You do, you are protected, um, and uh, there's also things like um, if you do, if you write and you, you're lucky enough that the producer doesn't do a runner, um, and you've written for TV and radio, you you get to actually money paid into your pension, um, which is a, a very generous. Uh, guild pension scheme which used to be just for sitcoms but actually we we sort of pushed and pushed and we got them uh you get um a pension now if you write sketches as, as well so uh that's a good thing and we're hoping also uh it's, it's sort of quite hard to work out how to do it but we're hoping if you write jokes for panel shows uh we're, we're trying to get that sort of included in the pension as well so that's um a little uh mention there of the guild it really is uh, worth joining that you You've got all the uh, details you'll know about that because you, you've got onto the website um, but um, if you go to the um, Writers Guild uh, Great Britain website you can find all the details how to join uh, there um, just before I come to the last question and then we'll be to taking all your uh, questions um, I just want to ask I, 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 I think uh, the industry is changing it, it has uh, huge, there are huge changes happening uh, streaming has has sort of revolutionized how we get our telly um and it it it, it is been, it's been a hard time for the bbc not just for political reasons but also just uh that uh, now more and more companies more the, the the independent companies are being swallowed up by uh the sort of giant uh, american corporations uh sony and via common people and they these uh it used to be uh when i was getting tv shows commissioned uh, uh, all the people that i knew at places like hat trick and avalon and baby cow were all people who sort of started from the same kind of gene pool of uh starting out as comedy writers and things now uh all these companies are getting owned by American companies so um, there's, there's a, a, a lot of changes happening so I just want to ask uh, everyone else in, in the panel how do you think the future uh, for comedy writing well, uh, uh, look into gaze into your crystal balls and predict what's going to happen in the next five years um, Nat um, I think making a living isn't going to get easier it's probably going to get more difficult but the opportunities to make your own things and take ownership of your own creations is probably greater than it ever has been yeah. um, certainly through podcasts or through online video you can really you know being a tired old lefty i like owning the means of production and you could do that um online uh, which insulates you somewhat against the fact that um well i mean streaming services are buying a lot more television than they you know than that's a market that didn't exist 10 years ago and that's huge now and that doesn't look like it's going anywhere in the near future i think the pressures will be on uh, terrestrial television mainly where there probably are fewer opportunities now than there have been in recent in the recent past um okay uh, hannah um i've been described as pathologically positive in my time and i kind of feel that like for me that, and, and also that's the way i kind of um deal with like i say the aforementioned uh, rejection is just that i'm very positive about it because i kind of think that that's what i don't know people sort of see people with shows and they're like oh they're so lucky and i just kind of think you make your own luck as well and you can do that so much more these days with the internet and with you know um yeah your own website or all the opportunities because there are lots of opportunities around um but i think in terms of making a living with the um uh, writing comedy is the thing that all of this stuff we've talked about today should be leading you towards is a, like an approach to an agent is getting an agent because if you're making a living from comedy for the most part at least for me is it's it's the script fees it's writing those scripts and obviously you know it takes years and years to sort of get to that point but once you're at that point i think that that's to get there you just need to do all this stuff we talked about so you know whether it's writing on news jack or it's um you know being part of a bbc writers room thing um or even just meeting one producer who wants to option your script and you need an agent basically i think you should put all your efforts into trying to get an agent because to me that is where the future of 
telly is is it's with the agents that doesn't really make sense i'm not sure it's the point i'm trying to make but what i'm trying to say is that the thing i would say for a new writer is try and get an agent and get that portfolio of stuff um that you're making or that you're known for um yeah does that matter okay I'll, I'll i'll just uh, add a point to that because that's the, the question that i get asked more than any other uh, on sort of comedy writing courses how do you get an agent um and it is it is getting harder uh, the, the answer was always write a brilliant script but now uh people say yeah well i wrote the script but I, no agents looking at my stuff now because you know who am i and you know that's only been exacerbated by pandemic because there's a lot of lot more people like like Bennett uh, who are around who suddenly uh, and they're not performing anymore and they're writing all their memoirs or whatever so it's it's, it's even harder to get the attention of a comedy agent now um, apart from writing the brilliant script then Hannah what would you how would you say to get that agent yeah well again it's those things like making those um little shorts that you put that you put online or you're making a short film or you've won a competition or you've been selected for something all these things that you can do so you're able to email an agent and be like these are all the things i've done because you know if, if you're just like oh i want to be a writer i'll email an agent of course they're not going to be interested in somebody who just wants to be a writer you have to show them that i think that you've got passion and also that you're going to take responsibility for your own career because you don't also just sign to an agent and suddenly become a well-paid writer you you know it's all about contacts and it's all about sort of you know your scripts and stuff like that so i just think keep yeah keep keep making things and don't be sort of frightened to to share your work with people as well i know lots of writers who have got a script but they've never sent it to a single agent and they're like god i can't get a bloody agent and you're kind of like well <laughs> you have to actually send these things out and, and and it is it's you know um it's what's the word um like revealing you know when you're sending your script out into the world but um that's the first step i guess okay uh, bennett what would you uh, say no idea <laughs> um, I think the, the main thing you should try and do, really, is avoid being a middle-aged white guy. So good luck with that, and uh, see what happens in the future. <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, Bennett. I think it is uh, it is true that uh, that the the day of the middle aged uh, white man, he said, being a middle aged white man, uh, I wouldn't say that they're numbered, but it's just actually uh, there's more competition. Um, which is, um, and you know, to be fair, I was been writing. I was writing for a good sort of twenty twenty five years uh, for all those kind of main topical comedy shows, and it was always uh, very nice for my ego to be thought of as one of the great writers. But occasionally, would wonder why uh, there's only men in this room and there's no ethnic minorities. But you know, well, maybe it's just that you know they. They asked all the men and they, they asked all the ethnic minorities and they asked all the women as well. But I'm still the greatest uh, topical comedy writer. So, uh, yeah, I think it is time we have to move a little bit uh, and, and away and allow a few more, allow a few more people the chance. Uh, uh, Emily, what's also, your... Also, I would, so, sorry to interrupt. Also, yeah. I would argue that, you know, being a middle-aged white man, I'm in writers' rooms a lot and it's still mostly middle-aged white men. So I don't mm. think that that's, a, you know, I don't think that's an adequate argument that you can't get work because you're a middle-aged white man. I think that, again, it's that thing of you make your own luck and you, you know, I don't think you're being discriminated against is yeah. what I'm saying. If you go to... I have to, uh, I have to agree with that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I think I just, it's a brilliant thing that there's more people coming through and from more places with more stories. And I think, you know, there's a reason that stories from people who are underrepresented on screen are resonating. And it's because they're stories that people haven't heard. Um, and that that's so much of what makes a good story, isn't it? Um, what makes a good mm. narrative is... is um, is that? I, and I, just, just, just to explain, so the point I was making was that it... I, and I think it didn't come across the way I intended it to, wants to say that it shouldn't just be... Of course, of government. course. Yeah. But I do think that there is this slight, slight sense, I think, sometimes that white, white, like middle-aged white guys are being discriminated against and like mm -hmm. everything's gone too far the other way and I just find that very difficult. All right, <laughs> yeah, Anna, that, uh, that, that, that wasn't the yeah. point. Uh, um, it's just not, just, I just don't think it's... Mm. it's, it's Okay. Just before I uh, come to you, Emily, with that last question, I, if you go to the uh, Chortle website, I've written an article which I po 
posted yesterday uh, in which I have uh, I asked the question how much of my success is down to my white male middle class privilege and uh, I've literally done an audit of my career uh, and and looked at what what it was about my career that um, is down to uh, the white maleness and what is down to my uh, obvious clear talents but uh, you know there, there are other things as well so uh, have a read of that article because I think that's I, I'd like to see that debate uh, open up a bit and that's that's kind of why I wrote that article but uh, so last question then for you Emily uh, before we go to the Q&A what's your how do you see uh, the future um, yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> um, I'm with Hannah. I'm sort of a perpetual optimist. Um, and I actually think the fact that we are, I hope, um, working hard as an industry towards something that is more inclusive, where we include more people's stories and we tell them in more ways, is a really, like, brilliant, brilliant thing. Um, and you can see that on our slates changing. I think on-screen representation has got much better. I think there's still a ton of work to do off-screen in terms of the types of people working behind sets. Um, but for me that that feels you know and I think something like the coronavirus happening you know everyone has to th think differently and interestingly from our point of view the people that we have been able to particularly in lockdown the only people who could work was writers so we you know even my job shifted towards more towards writers because they were the only people who could still do their job because they were often working from home so I think um, when then when the world all goes a bit wrong you sort of have to find solace in sort of seizing new opportunities finding new ways of working on things um so i suppose my like sort of sh like cautiously optimistic view is that it will sort of encourage a more level playing field so there'll be more people telling more stories and you know as as the uk has done for so many years like we'll continue to you know really punch above our weight internationally as well in terms of um you know where we where we sit and i think that from the bbc's point of view that's exciting because obviously we do a ton of work with newer talent and we've created more entry points we're working super hard to try and work out where we need to create more entry points for different types of talent but also there's co-pro so there's more there's sort of more money <laughs> um with american co-productions so actually and um, the fact that our you know the bbc's overall budgets are shrinking actually there's there's more opportunities coming from outside the uk for us to work with more people so overall it feels like you can be quite optimistic in terms of the role of british writers going forwards so that would be my quite long window today, saying it's going to be well, fine <laughs> lot, lot, you know a lot a lot of cause for optimism there yes i think uh, charlie brooker just signed a deal for something like 77 million uh, dollars or pounds i don't know uh once you get past uh, 100 grand i think it's sort of <laughs> you know pretty good um so yeah so so that the, 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 there is money out there and and, and so as you say uh, emily it's about it's, it's, it's about the whole, uh, not just about uh, the British shrinking uh, budget. So I'm going to uh, try and crack through as many questions as possible. I don't think we have to finish bang on three, but uh, I've got, um, I'll, I'll go through them now. The first question from Sue Last. Uh, how do we go viral? We've posted our comedy sketch web series on YouTube, uh, and use Facebook and Instagram to spread the word. Hannah, how do you go viral? <laughs> That's a very good question. And it's, it's an, an impossible, hello, it's an impossible answer to give as well I think the thing is often it's the content and it's the length if something is um, shorter than maybe 30 seconds people are going to be more inclined to watch it even if, if you've got your web series like cut out a 30 second clip of something from it don't put the whole because people aren't going to sit there and watch you know five minutes of it necessarily if they've just scrolled past it I think making sort of these bite size um, things also making it again something about something that's already um, going viral i.e um, something that's happening on the internet or something to do with politics um, because that will because I know what you mean when you just post something you're like well who's going to look at this apart from my friends and maybe some people from school I hated like that's pretty much the only people I have on on Facebook so um, but yeah I definitely think it's content it's keeping it short my father his silent sketch was I think it was 30 37 seconds long and when I looked at the stats people would stop watching by about 28 seconds because they were like well I, I kind of get the joke that's fine um <laughs> so actually I could have made it shorter is is more important yeah. um but yeah again and it's stupid things like hashtags or acting in somebody who's famous or um I think we've had quite a lot of luck with drunk women solving crime is just that we are able to have celebrity guests and celebrity endorsement as it were so if you can try and somehow make that happen for your sketch, if it's, you know, if it's like you think that a particular celebrity might like, 
Um, you might get a retweet. Who knows? <laughs> well, um, I think one thing I'd like to mention at this stage as well, and this applies to everything across uh, everything you do in your career, um, invariably the thing that you'd love and the thing that you think, this is the thing, this is what I'm really passionate about, and I put all my love and hope and effort into it, those are the things that generally don't happen. And then suddenly you just, uh, someone says, oh, by the way, uh, this, this kind of half, Asked thing that you thought about yeah we'll commission that we'll give you a series suddenly you've got a series for something that you kind of thought about for about 30 seconds and thought oh that's a good idea blah blah and it's it's not that you just spent 30 seconds thinking about it and that's all it's all the years of pain and, and anguish and failure and rejection that go into that so you know the, 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 the you can't actually say oh this is here's how we make a, exactly how we make a viral video it's just it, it happens but it only happens when you keep doing all the other stuff that gets rejected um so uh next question any tips for creating good quality podcasts in a room next to a main road without studio level facilities uh Nat, do you? Um, um, well, uh, acoustic foam is always handy. A decent mic uh, might not break the bank. It depends. So for about fifty pounds, you can get mics that are worth having. And that we just had to do a, just a, a series of audio plays, which we had to record locally. And we had a, a bunch of um, blue snowballs, which we sent around to the cast who didn't have their own mics, and they um, worked to studio quality. Once we'd done a lot of compression on them. So yes, be prepared to spend a lot of time in post-production, squishing compression, um, I guess, if you can't afford, I mean, presumably, yes, if you don't want to do it, if you want to do it cheaply, then you can get a mic for about £50, get some acoustic foam for probably about another 40 or 50 I, I heard a tip from someone which was a guy who said uh, and he used to be in some sort of giant loft and he was podcasting and he said what he did was he put up an umbrella uh, over him and he put a, like a big sort of tarpaulin sheet over the umbrella so he was kind of cocooned inside this tarpaulin sheet and he said it just completely you know cut out sort of 95% of the kind of dead empty air around him so that's the thought. Well, one tip I would sorry. No go on that. Uh, just one thing I'd remind people is if you have bought a lovely microphone which is sitting on your desk put something between the desk and the base of the microphone like a towel to stop every time you tap it or and stop getting reflections off the desk that's why I, I found putting a, putting a duvet uh, over yeah, my head yeah, yeah. really worked well for some bizarre reason and go straight to bed afterwards yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I would say as well is with drunk women we we use this I use this what I'm talking to you now I mean you don't necessarily have to have all the kit a lot of the time it's about the um, it's just about the content and also because we're all using the same kind of mic if you know if one person is using a very very posh setup it's going to make us all sound crap but we all sound sort of <laughs> at the same sort of level um and also i think during lockdown people understand i think our listeners understood that they could either have a slightly sort of less quality recording but still have the show every week or we just stopped doing it so i think that it was the sort of the lesser of two evils so i'd say even if you've just got this if you've got something to say and you've got a good idea then just like oh, that's kind of came with my phone like yeah I never use my phone to talk on. So okay, so Grant, Grant McGregor, thanks for that question. Nina Davis, uh, is the Carolina Hearn bursary for Northern writers only? Emily, no, it's not. Um, we have tended to because it's Carolina Hearn's bursary. Um, it's I think we have gone with Northern writers in the past, but it's not a prerequisite that you have to be Northern to apply. Okay. Okay, so that's uh, good. So, um, Shirley Day, what are people's favourite books on writing comedy, apart from The Complete Comedy Writer by Dave Cohen, of course. Um, uh, any, uh, anyone got to your favourite comedy writing books? That's, yeah, yeah. that's going to grab something, I think. Um. Bennett, choose one from the bookshelf behind you. <laughs> Let's see you so choose one, a book. The yeah. top left-hand corner is one that uh, I actually wrote during lockdown, funny enough, <laughs> which is called, uh, it's called My First Sitcom. And I just want to say that a percentage of all um, money, it's four ninety nine, it's 10,000 words, and a percentage of all money goes to um, Alzheimer's charity and Parkinson's charities. So if you want to buy it, I'll put the link, Chris, on my website if you want to get it. Even if you don't want to write a sitcom, but you just want to help people with Alzheimer's. Um, so well, there you go. Yeah, yeah. there is that also. Yeah. <laughs> Hannah? 
And do you know what one that I mean it's kind of controversial this one, which is Save the Cat. I don't know if you've read Save the Cat, but it's um, Blake Snyder. Yeah, right. And it's some some writers are like, oh no, it just you know it just means that you're kind of staying very much because he literally has a beat sheet. It's like you put in the, the the page number of the um, of the script you're writing, and it tells you what should happen at each stage of the script. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of mind blowing in a way because if you're if I'm having problem with a script, even when I'm writing like an eleven minute um, children's TV thing sometimes I will just put the structure into that and be like right that's what I'm missing I'm missing the moment it goes wrong or I'm missing the moment that we think it's gone okay and as long as you don't completely and utterly stick to it the whole time because otherwise your script will be predictable I think that's actually a really good um, and interesting book um, and also good if you want to like I want to write quite mainstream movies in the end that's what I want to do is write films and I you know I don't want to write a film that's um not going to make, I guess, loads of money. So I, it's for mainstream film writing, basically. Um, so I would, yeah, recommend it. And you can use it for sitcom. You can use it for 11 minutes, you know. Anything. Okay. Um, Nat, have you got a book? Um, yes, it was Mike Sachs. Uh, and here's the kicker, which is interviews with um, American humorists. But he also did another one called Dissecting the Frog, which is just interviews with people who've been doing it for hundreds of years. Lots of people from the 40s and 50s. Uh, yeah. Mm. Okay. I've got two books that I recommend. Uh, Sally Holloway, uh, got Serious Guide to Joke Writing. Sally was a, uh, a stand-up um, from my era of stand-up. And um, it's a great book. It's just a really, you know, if you're stuck for how to write a joke or a subject, uh, it's, a, it's a really good book. Uh, the other book is uh, by a writer called Aristotle, and it's called The Poetics. Uh, and it's about 2,000 years old, and it's about 30 pages long. Um, and in fact, the bit about uh, comedy, it's about comedy, tragedy, and drama. And in fact, most of the bit about comedy is lost. Um, but uh, you read about tragedy, you see how tragedy and comedy are uh, s incredibly similar. And of course, the American comedian, uh, Steve Allen, came up with, with the uh, equation that comedy is tragedy plus time. Um, and so, you know, you've, you've you learn about the stuff that's tragic in the world that's where a lot of comedy comes from so those are my two recommendations uh, a question here now from uh, Anne Marie Eels which I had and now has gone again oh here we go ha Anne Marie Eels asks has anyone else created a work contract with themselves to ensure that at least 20 hours a week go into writing with hours on what to work on or just me uh anyone got an answer I think that's a fantastic idea actually but uh, what do you reckon uh Nat? i've tried to do it but it's never worked i have sat down and broken the week up and go this is gonna be this project and this is gonna be this and by the end of the week they'll all be done and they're not they're never <laughs> i did write a contract for myself and my lawyer read it and suggested i didn't sign it <laughs> I think a contract if that's what works for you I think that's a great shout like it's really good my my top tip of what I do is I always give myself really achievable goals and that I smash every single day I'm just like oh I need to have like written this part and then I always go above and beyond but everything I do above that I'm like yeah this is <laughs> this is really yeah <laughs> uh, okay Okay, great. This is an important thing to remember in making a living from comedy in that, in that um, you can always avoid broadening your definition of what comedy is. Like, if you just lower your expectations about what you've been doing, <laughs> much easier. Because I did lots of things, had to do lots of things like I wrote listicles for the poke, which I sort of counted as still doing comedy, but they weren't very funny. Uh, but there are these other jobs which aren't necessarily TV or radio, even if it's running a brand social media campaign writing jokes for Twix or something. That's still joke writing in exchange for money. And I think if you have to lots of us have to do lots of those jobs which we don't always talk about a lot um and they're worth bearing in mind as part of how you make a living writing mm. jokes and uh so uh nat's latest selection of uh, jokes for the uh, saudi arabian arms trade uh, uh, are available <laughs> on netflix um i the uh, um, actually one other book recommendation that, that sort of follows on from that uh is uh, a book called um getting things done um which i read this year and it's by uh it's my man called david allen uh, so it's not even dave allen the comedian it's not a comedy book but in terms of uh sorting out all the 
crap in my brain and actually being able to to uh come up with with um you know kind of not be overwhelmed by work that's that's a, that's a pretty good book for that um i've got a question from laura davis laura says i wanted to ask emily if it's worth trying to send unsolicited scripts specifically for the bbc short comedy slots um uh she's um been writing them over a lot of the lockdown period um who would be the best person to approach yeah we we um as you well, like we we um we can't accept unsolicited scripts just because we would we're a really small team and we would be totally overwhelmed um but the best route through is to go to a production company um because we work with so many different production companies um from the smallest to the biggest ones so if you can get um your script into a production company and let them know you want it to come to us then they should be able to help you with that um, uh, but I, you know we've talked about it in the past but there's just it's just so difficult for us and that's why we have our schemes and our opportunities for people to submit scripts so that if people do want to come to us there is a sort of defined window for them to do that also oh sorry emily I'll talk no no go for it I, I would say because the thing is i think i saw like a few faces when you said to go to production companies they also all have this they will not accept unsolicited mm. scripts which is kind of which i it was that sort of massive catch-22 thing that i came up against when i was first starting of like i want an agent can get an agent without an option can get an option you know couldn't get it to anyone so the way i sort of got around that it was to sort of make it solicited in the sense that you kind of you can well meeting people is really difficult now because of covid and stuff but i remember i went to a couple of bbc writers rooms thing and i met a couple of producers a couple of development producers there and because they've had that face-to-face -face contact and you've had a chat and also don't mention your script like do not mention your script because that is the last thing a development producer wants is you pitching over a glass of wine just try and make a connection i always think that's the best way because actually the whole of tv is just connections and it's sort of people um so yeah there are sort of ways around mm. the um non-solicited scripts but yeah yeah. And I think uh, to, to add to that as well, I think, you know, 99.99% of, of your scripts, I think, won't get made. So, but which is a very hard thing to hear at this point. But when, if you're, if you manage to get that sort of meeting with an agent or something, uh, or, or a producer, and they say, no, I'm not really sure about that idea. What else have you got? Have, be sure to have things you know to say okay and, and and that's a really good thing because you know we do we we do love our babies too much you know and and, and we forget that actually most of the time as andy and guy pointed out even your babies you know they, they don't get when you're high height of success they don't necessarily get made so have things have things well i did have an idea actually for martin clunes or something you know it's, it's something you just thought of on the bus on the way there or something. and and it just happens that that person had been talking to martin clunes that morning and he said god i'm really looking for some sort of idea that's often that that's the kind of thing i was talking about where something suddenly happens and the, the thing that you put all your effort into you know just don't just don't expect that to be the thing uh, that gets made um we, so, we do work sorry just really quickly i just said um we do work a lot more closely with the audio team now than we used to as well i think sometimes like in the past the television sat really separately from audio um so in terms of you know you talk about doing podcasts and things like that like there are you know, we're trying to get out to the community as well like we're trying to sort of find you guys as much as you're trying to find us but it just um and we've talked about unsolicited scripts so many times but um there are ways that like if you put your yourself out there like we are actively we will actively try and find you <laughs> Spookily, Emily, uh, just the, uh, the, the next question was going to be, and for you, from Desi Lyon, uh, does uh, Emily also work with radio writers or just TV? Yeah, so we, we have a, a separate team for radio, um, but I don't know if you've seen Ladhood, that's something that started on Radio 4 and is yeah. now on BBC Three. Um, so we, we've Liam got... Liam Williams, yeah. Yeah, Liam Williams, exactly. So we sort of, we are very actively, so we, not anymore, because but we used to have a weekly meeting with the BBC Sounds comedy team, so they'd tell us who they were commissioning, who they were working with, and we'd share, you know, we'd share talent lists and... Um, so that's, we don't, at the moment we don't commission anything for radio, but we would absolutely, if we got something in that we felt was a good proposition for radio, we'd be able to um, put, put you into the radio team. Okay, I just want to say it's uh, getting to about quarter past three now, and uh, I'm just looking through and I've noticed 81, oh, 82 new messages. Uh, I guess we're not going to get through all the questions, but I just wanted to check with the panellists. Are you able to stay for a few more minutes? Or, uh, yeah, sure. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, if one of you has to go, then I guess um, 
then uh, so we've got a question now uh, about um, uh, from uh, Lorelei uh, Matthias about uh, um, how do you manage your multiple uh, projects when pitching to an agent and that, that, that's that in fact we sort of answer that question just now is rather than going to an agent and saying look I've got 20 things um, I think that uh, uh, Hannah's point is if you can get some time with an agent and kind of listen listen to them find out what makes them excited and if you've got 20 ideas in your head uh, or 20, 20 projects that you think you can pitch just really listen to what the agent has to say and they'll say and you'll go ah actually now funny you should mention that I've had an idea for this so I, I wouldn't give I wouldn't sit with an agent and say right okay here's my list number one da, 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 da. I'm not sure about that okay number two I think you know it's a sort of law of diminishing returns that uh, you know by the time you get to number 17 and I'll say no that's enough and you go oh god number 17 that was going to be the one um, <laughs> but I yeah so, so listen as much I, I, and also I think and this might sound uh, you know, I get a hollow laugh from you all from uh, after everything that we've said uh, is that um, uh, actually you're you are employing the agent you know that agent is going to take 10% of all your money you want to know think of it from that point of view as a professional writer you want to know is this person the right person for me because too many people we go when we want an agent we're too much going please please take me please take me and actually be professional think about hang on is this person but, you know kind of try and be cool headed about it um so that's the uh that, that, that's more advice i'd give about agents Can I uh, that? it's not you don't necessarily need an agent to get a job either and certainly my first agent i got because i had the contract i needed someone to negotiate it and in, agents are much more likely to sit down have a nice long chat with you if you've already got a contract in your hand saying i've got a script permission for this or i've got so you can do comp competitions you can take meetings you can write things and you know get them into people's hands and if you can get even a sliver of paid work that shows an agent a that there's some money they get just for signing you and but b that there's the possibility you're going to generate work for yourself later on in your career yeah okay uh i'm just uh, i've got a quite long question here um somebody uh last with lulu sent a script to uh a, a somebody and um they they um never got back in touch um it's uh, um this is a different oh, it's a producer at the bbc who didn't get back in touch it's a, it is it's a tricky one this um, i mean how what what do you do when somebody doesn't get back in touch with you any uh, panel any suggestions unfortunately i say like welcome to the rest of your career that's pretty oh. much what happens it's it's about not putting all your eggs in one basket it's about the fact this producer probably has a lot going on it's i find a good thing to do is like it's never personal um i may like you know it may well be people may just hate me but i always think this you know it's not personal if someone doesn't get back to you and you also don't want to be that person that's constantly nagging someone and how long is the right length of time to leave somebody who is already busy with other scripts you know i mean it, it can be months and even when you're a writer who's sort of had lots of stuff on and you know you're still waiting months for people to read and often get back to you to say no um, but the, the good thing is that you've got it to that person and that's great and just keeping on sort of trying to get it to you know more people or get that agent um, because yeah it's you've got to get it to more than one producer often as well yeah i've just just i've got a few bits of advice for the podcaster person in who lived near, near a busy road helen simpson says we use a toilet tent uh i, I, I I hate to ask what a toilet tent is but uh someone else says uh sit in a wardrobe which is a great idea uh another one make a pillow stroke blanket fort which sounds a little bit like uh bennett's uh, duvet there uh right so um someone uh robbie has uh, written us uh, says i'm part of bbc local radio sketch show uh we've been told uh for five years it's one of the few genuine writers rooms in the country uh how do we get the attention of people higher up in the bbc well there's nobody here higher up in the bbc than emily today so <laughs> what do you reckon emily i wish i had all the answers sometimes um yeah. I, I i don't know i didn't i didn't even know that's good that there are i didn't even know there were regional 
writing um, wow. opportunities. That's great. I <laughs> should probably be much more across it. It's probably what I'd say to that. Um, it's I the mean, BBC. If it's, really well, if it's a successful show, you know, th it will probably get picked. You'd hope that it would get, grow and get picked up and give it more and more exposure and you'd be able mm. to progress from there. Um, yeah. It's called the BBC Norfolk New Comedy Show, which sounds okay. a lot like uh, the, the Alan Partridge uh, <laughs> uh, show, isn't it? Nor we, um, Norfolk Matters. Or, uh, yeah, we have. So we just did a show called Stand Up for Live Comedy. I don't know if anyone saw it, it was on BBC Three. And um, with that, we were really actively trying to go around the country. Um, so we went to um, Belfast, Bristol, Birmingham, Glasgow. Um, mm -hmm. It was a bit of a chasing where we where it wasn't locked down to be honest, but we we did we did what we could. But the point of that was um, as much about trying to bring through new comics um, from who are from um, not from not so sort of South London centric skewed. So we are trying to do more regional activity okay. as well. And um, there's actually going to be something that's launching before the end of the year, which has a really strong regional focus, so that people who are based outside, you know, what people might say the centres of power feel like there's potentially more opportunity for them there. Oh, okay. Um, Elliot Stanton has asked a question which we have already answered, I think. Do the BBC accept unsolicited sitcom scripts outside bursaries and competitions? But then, uh, so um, that's that's a kind of, um, that, that you, you, just, you just don't take unsolicited stuff, do you? Uh, we just, I'm afraid we just don't. Um, we don't. We do have a lot of people looking for writers yeah. and a lot of other ways in, but we don't expect consistent. Yeah. Okay, Thomas has asked, um, I've written for Newsjack, are they looking for more writers to join their team? Or are you looking for more? So, um, I, what I know of Newsjack is um, they will always uh, be looking for new writers because uh, Newsjack is like a sort of training ground for new writers. So if you keep getting jokes on uh, the show, um, they, you'll be invited to uh, write some more, you know, you'll be invited to, 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 to meet the team and things. So uh yeah just keep sending jokes one of the hardest things sorry nat yeah you want to drop in an extra thing there if you have written for jokes for newsjack and they don't get onto newsjack that it well there was before lockdown probably isn't at the moment but both the treason show and um news review also it's not yeah. radio or tv but they are staged uh comedy topical sketch shows who will pay you for your jokes although not very much yeah. Um, uh, one thing uh, that the, the, the hardest thing I would say to do in topical comedy when a show is running is uh, that um, it um, is, is to not get anything on on the listen the show goes out tonight uh, Thursday night and you'll find out then that you haven't got anything on but then you have to get up on Friday morning and start writing jokes for the following week and that's uh, that that's one of the hardest things you know you write three four weeks for the show and you don't get anything on you think well I might as well give up but that's what everybody thinks therefore you have to keep going and the, the number of people who are sending stuff has diminished so uh, you have to just keep going um, so I'm just running through. There's quite a few more. Uh, I think that might actually uh, be. I'm just. Um, there's a lot of uh, questions, and I think uh, you are. Let me see. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Actually, uh, I think those are. Um, the um great yes I, that that's yeah we're just getting to a lot of people uh sort of thanking us and stuff so um one last thing then to say thanks um so thanks to everybody and um you know well well uh thanks ever so much to the panel you've been absolutely brilliant uh hannah george bennett aaron Nat Tapley and uh, Emily Allen. Thanks all very much. Don't forget to check the Writers Guild uh, website and uh, have a look and see all the great things the Writers Guild do. Thank you all very much. I think this has been a really uh, useful um, uh, afternoon and uh, I hope you all enjoyed it and good luck with your careers.